So, Jose, thank you for joining our class. And Absolutely. Let me let me put you on um, on big screen, and I'm, I am recording the class, and and some of the people are going to be asking questions as we go along. But will you tell us a little bit about who you are and what did you do before Latin dance? Absolutely. First, let's do a couple of tests. Can you hear my voice correct? And everything, camera is all good. Yes. Perfect. Great. Great. Uh, so first, thank you so much, Rodrigo and Wendy, for having me. A little bit about myself. My name is Jose Serrano. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, so yo hablo español 100%. I came to the country when I was 17 years old, but I'll back up a little bit. I've been dancing since age five. Uh, my sister wanted to be a ballet dancer, just like every little girl, and the ballet studio was about an hour away. So I had to uh, make sure that my sister was safe. This is age five, six, and seven. Uh, for about three years, we took public transportation in Puerto Rico. Uh, and it's not like the United States. The United States was a beautiful sign with a bus schedule and stuff like that. In Puerto Rico, public transportation is more like hitchhiking oh with God. strangers. So now looking back at that, I can even imagine how or why we did it, but we did it. It was about an hour away and I started dancing ballet. And I even came to the United States. I got full scholarship to a lot of summer programs here in the United States. And my career started and was established not far from you guys. It was actually in Columbia, South Carolina, with a company called Columbia City Ballet under the direction of William Stark. I was actually the principal dancer for Columbia City Ballet for 10 years. My contract was 89 shows a year for 10 years. So then after the 10 years, I retired from the ballet world and I came back to the Latin world. The Latin world has always been part of me. Every summer during the ballet season, I would compete at the Puerto Rico Salsa Open. I would compete at this place called Latin Quarters in New York. Um, now we have stuff like the World Latin Cup, the World Salsa Championship, the World Salsa Summit. Right. We even have different competitions around the world. But back then, it wasn't. It was more like club competitions. And everybody would come together and kind of social dance, compete. And other people would have routines and choreography. Some people even have like acting choreographies. They have like stuff like vampires or like Romeo and Juliet or like Robocop or like hip hop mixed with salsa. I see videos um, so of that in LA, right? Yeah, people yeah. In LA, LA, it was very theatrical. Um, so people mix a lot of different things with Latin music, which was awesome. And it, it actually turned into what the Latin scene is today, which is a big fusion of every single dance, all the way from classical ballet to street, salsa, bachata, merengue, cumbia, whatever you want it, you know, um, which is fantastic. Um, myself as a Latin dancer, when I came back, my dad was actually a salsa dance, a salsa singer, and my mom was his backup dancer, and I was born into this. So that's how long I've been involved in this scene. Um, a lot of people don't know but there is something called Salsa Congresses. And Salsa Congresses is major events that professional artists and all the way up to students can attend. And there's different ways of attending. The number one way of attending is buying a plane ticket, buying a pass, taking class, sitting down as an audience member, enjoying the show, clapping, social dancing. There's also a level two, which is a performer. So then from as a performer, you're part of a company like Rodrigo and Wendy, for example, you learn a routine for four to five months, you go on set, you put a cute costume on, you dance, people clap, you get addicted, you go back and you do it all over again. And then the last level is that you are invited and paid by the event. And they actually pay for your flight, for your hotel, they give you per diem and feed you for food, plus a salary. And depending on how many people are in the audience, that depends on your salary. And it ranges anywhere from 500 up to $5,000. Right. There's some even Latin dancers today that charge $15,000 a weekend to do this. And they travel every weekend. Yeah, we had, we had the opportunity to talk a little bit about that um, before because we wanna, we've been, you know, I've been focusing not just on like teaching them how to dance, but right. also teaching them the life of, you know, what it means to be a professional Latin dancer, right? 
So Correct. this is something that they heard a little bit about, and then you just clarify a, a lot of little points as well. Correct. Absolutely. And people always talk about, well, what about the financial side of, the, of a Latin dancer? Well, there's multiple ways, but I'll narrow it down to three. Number one way that you can uh, generate income as a Latin dancer is being a traveling artist, mm -hmm. which is an event hires you, they pay for your flight, hotel, food, and you get a check at the end of the weekend. So that's number one. Number two is to actually have a studio. Have a studio, become an instructor, go get training, get certified, and you have students and you develop your own class and you develop your own teams. And you generate income from that. And then number three is, event organizer so as a latin dancer you can create events what we call weekenders and you invite other artists to come to your studio and this generate profit and income and you split that profit so there's actually a lot of business transactions that happens in the latin world so those are the three major ones i personally also involve myself and do percentage of profit with the congresses that hire me so I am also a sponsor of these events at a bigger scale. And just to give you a little bit of ballpark range, one of the biggest events in the United States um, is about 3,800 people. And the average ticket price per person is $900 times 3,800. So you do the math and imagine 10% of that commission. Right. Correct. And there's obviously a lower scale of things of maybe events of like 200 people where they pay $20 a person. Well, do the math, 20 times 200, and you divide that in half by the studio owner. I believe that's a good weekend of profit just to go have fun in one, two, three, five, six, seven. That's all you're doing. Yeah? Now, a little bit about, oh yeah, sure. I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> now, just to get back a little bit about like, um, on your background of fusing a little bit of ballet into salsa when you first started competing you know in salsa the world you know at the major competitions how did you feel about like bringing in ballet as a background and how were you afraid that maybe the judges wouldn't accept it or did you did you feel like you were the only one at that time trying to do that or because you know, in, in the Latin dance community, I feel like we have a mix of everything. We have people that can be classically trained. And right. we also have people that have like walked out from the street and took their first class, got so addicted and they immersed themselves mm -hmm. into the culture and dance that made it a career as well. So you have a little bit of both, right? But Absolutely. you know, so how did you feel about like, bringing something else to the table such as like your ballet background to it correct absolutely so i want to say maybe 20 years ago maybe 25 years ago i haven't done the math you know i'm 22 forever right yeah oh, it's a um, night cream does wonders that's right cucumbers <laughs> cucumbers cucumbers yeah um yeah no one of the first times that my sister and i so my sister was my dance partner all through my professional career which is an amazing experience to share it with a family member we actually used to get disqualified at competitions for doing tricks. We used, to get, we used to get disqualified for doing multiple spins and not maintaining our basic. So back then, they used to always just um, point system by stepping, and you would have to pivot step turn every individual turn. So a double turn, multiple turn, tornado spins, fuerte turns, none of this was allowed. But me being Puerto Rican and me putting my foot down, I would still do it. Um, one of the major competitions that happened, there was out of all of the competitors, there was two people that got standing ovation. My sister and I, and the person that won first place. We got disqualified and they won first place. Oh. We still went out, we still bowed to the audience, right? Oh, and yeah. now today, what happened was, by us doing that for so many years, other people started doing that. I remember so vividly, the following year, everybody did a trick starting their routine. Of course. It was amazing to watch that. And then the judges were like, well, what are we going to do? Yeah. Create another category. That's right. And so the Salsa Cabaret category right. was born. And then the Salsa Open Division, where everything is open and everything is allowed, was born. But before, it was not allowed. It was only on one 
and down two, and that's it. <laughs> so it was very interesting for me to watch that process happen. And the fact that I got to experience that personally, and, uh, and to this day, I still know the judges that disqualified me back then. There are now judges today still judging me. And every time I looked at them, I'm always like, we have an <laughs> internal conversation, which is awesome. Now, um, you know, Jose, you're just so full of knowledge and because you've been around for so long and you've been in, in multiple worlds in the dance scene, but I want to give the opportunity to our students to like, if they have any questions, guys, please feel free to just interrupt Absolutely. and ask questions. Okay. So, because we want to make sure that we don't have a long time with him today. Um, so he'll let me know whenever it's time to, to go, but I want to make sure that some of you guys can have an opportunity to ask questions and I have my list as well. So we're just going to have to like put our stuff out there. Okay. Go for it. Calvin. Um, just a quick question. It was about you coming from, you did, you said you were doing ballet and then you went back into doing salsa dancing. Was it a lot harder coming back into doing salsa dancing or was the muscle memory still there? It was actually easier. And the reason why it was easier because as a ballet dancer, our short-term memory is larger than the average Latin dancer or the average person. For example, if I was to say, let's do please on quad right? That's two dips, one grand plie. That's about three and a half minutes of exercise that I just said in two seconds, <laughs> right? If I say, let's go across the floor. Uh, so tell it, tell it vaguely, saw assembly. But right there, that's an entire combination for 40 students in the class for 20 minutes. A Latin dancer doesn't have that advantage. So for example, if somebody was to say, Syncopated over cross, crossover to the cue and flare out. Perfect, got it. One and two and three, five, six, seven, one, two, three, five, done. Versus the Latin dancer has to be like, wait, what was that? One, two, show and it will take them again. longer. <laughs> yeah, show me again. That's right, every time. But as a, as a ballet dancer, as a technician that I call, I consider us to be advanced students. And we have an advantage over the regular person because they don't know how they learn or they don't know how to intake choreography to be able to adapt it into the muscle memory and execute it immediately or instantly. The other thing that we have as a, as a ballet dancer as an advantage is character. For example, a Latin dancer, you teach them steps, they rehearse, and through the process of rehearsing, they develop a character mm -hmm. versus us trained dancers well, we do characters all the time. Jose, Don Q, Pa, Percer, Pa, Julia, Pa, right? So we can do characters instantly without thinking because we have an, an extensive vocabulary of characters in our knowledge, yeah? So I would say as a trained dancer to go into the Latin world or the ballroom world even, we have frame. We know how to hold our bodies. We know what a porter bra is. We know exactly what it is to connect with somebody else, yeah? So I would say that we are a huge advantage. Yeah, okay, nice we have question. a couple more questions. Um, Lily, go ahead and ask your question. So this is kind of like, I'll make this not as vague as possible. What has been your favorite thing so far as a dancer? Like, is there like a favorite thing you learned or like a favorite show or just like, what has been your favorite thing so far as being a dancer? Absolutely. One of my favorite things as a dancer is to improv. So for example, at these Salsa Congress events, a lot of professionals, they actually train for four, six months, even a year. One of my favorite things to do is at the event, let's say on Friday night, I find a girl, one of the pros and be like, hey, you want to perform tomorrow? And they think I'm crazy. But what they don't know is that I'm serious. I actually carry around a lot of costumes for girls and jackets for me to match. And if somebody says yes, I literally go on stage with a piece of music. I press play and do it for the first time in the audience. And what happens is it creates some magic between us because we're so concentrated and connected. And the audience doesn't know this. After the fact, the MC will say that was the first time they did it or they just made it up on the spot and it's spontaneous. And it creates a special magic. So to me, to be able to experience that with a Latin dancer is, I would say, one of my favorite things. I actually did this with Wendy. We had an event in North Carolina called Baila Cura. And that same day I said, Wendy, we're gonna do this, this, and this. And she's like, okay, sounds good. 
<laughs> I'm gonna do this and this and this. She's like, but when do I come on? I was like, I'll just let you know. When I spin, I'll come on. And the first thing I do is what? Spin. And I'm like, do I come on now? He's like, no. And so he's cueing me as he's performing. And not only do we have like a couple hours to prepare, but it's like an intricate little piece, you know, like lifts yeah. and I have to do all kinds of Spins. stuff. I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. It was awesome. So I would say that that is my favorite thing is to share the stage with a Latin dancer and to be able to perform for the first time a piece full out on stage. Imagine performing without rehearsing. Oh, okay. We have a couple more questions. Um, Adi, go for it. And then we have Anna and then Karis. Okay, just go for it, guys. Um, did you have a lot of pressure from your parents to become a dancer since like everybody in your family was a dancer? Or did you just kind of like, did they let you do your own thing? And then you were like, well, wait, like this is in the blood. Like I need to do this. So like which, which way did it lean toward? That is a great question. I actually did have support with my parents in the beginning when I was a little kid. But once I became an adult, they actually wanted me to go to college. And I had to sit my mom down. And I remember to this day vividly. And I told her, I was like, mom, I want to be a professional dancer. I have to go to New York. I got to go to SAB. I have to go into the summer programs. I actually ended up going to Pennsylvania Ballet. I was a full-time student there. And I did summer programs there. But I remember having that conversation with my mom. And she looked at me and said, me home? You can do whatever you want, but just know that if you're going to be a dancer, you're going to work for the rest of your life. And I was like, okay, got it. Now looking back at this, I'm like, well, every adult has to work for the rest of their life anyway. So why not do what you love to do, which is be on stage and dance? So the answer is yes. Awesome. Okay, go ahead, Anna. Hello, Jose. My question for you is what uh, challenges have you faced in your career and what have you learned from them? Challenges. So challenges in my career is actually from being Puerto Rican. Uh, from being Puerto Rican was definitely a challenge in the ballet world. And then coming into the Latin world, believe it or not, being a ballet dancer that comes into the Latin world was also a challenge because I was so technical. Um, and everything looked like clean and sharp. And in the Latin world, you have to be clean and sharp, but there has to be a little bit of a wobble. There has to be a little bit of like a shaky moment so that the audience connects to that. When it's sometimes when it's too perfect, the people can't really connect to that. So I actually like the improvisational part of dance. So then I would say that my challenges were my technique, which is my strength too. So that's actually a really good question. Thank you for asking. Yeah, you know, I have to say that um, in your position, I, I wonder, you know, you have to be uh, technical, but then yeah. still maintaining the essence of Latin dance, which yeah. also, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have any technique, but it has to have some kind of rawness to it yes. that you have to perfectly combine with yeah. your ballet background. And Absolutely. that's always the challenge, right? Because like, yeah. you want to make sure that people see you as like, oh, he has had training, but he's a Latin dancer, which is Correct. very difficult to do. You know, yes. if you immerse yourself so much into one style that you cannot, you know, become the other style, right? Correct. Absolutely. You know, and then when you are like, there's a couple of people in the Latin world that are trained dancers and they train, I want to say up to like, maybe five, even seven, eight, maybe even 10 years. But when you have somebody that trained in ballet for like 25 years, it gives a different spine, yeah? And when you, the Latin dance has to be more organic and more grounded and a little bit, it has to be, I don't wanna say sloppy, but it has to be, the movement has to be fluid. And as a ballet dancer, we're so stiff that it's really hard for us to break that. Um, so to add to the question of um, the lady, I believe Hannah was her name, um, the stiffness of ballet and how much frame and how much control of our body does, that was actually a challenge for me to go into the Latin world to be fluid and movement and body roll. So that took a long time. That took a very long time. Okay. We have another question from Karis. Go for it, Karis. Yes. Hi, thank you for being here today. Um, I wanted to know, since you grew up, 
in the Latin dance scene and you, your family was so dance heavy and all involved in dance as well. Um, how were you able to develop your own personal artistry and style within that while being surrounded by so many other artists? Was it, did it make it easier? Was it, was it more difficult? It was actually easier. The fact, um, one of the things in the ballet world, for example, that is so structured, right? Everything is really like black and white, right? And for me being Puerto Rican and being Latin, I still did the ballet structure, but I had a different flair to it. Like my hand would flick and my head would turn and I would just do things just slightly different. And people would be like, I don't know what it is, but I like it. And then I got hired and I became, I rose through the ranks and it was a blessing. And I used it as a tool versus me trying to fit and look like everybody else. From the waist down, I tried my best to be as technically as possible, but from the waist up, it was different. It was always Puerto Rican. One of my favorite stories is I did a ballet um, in Romeo and Juliet and we have to kiss on stage. Um, it's one of the first times that I kissed on stage without practicing kissing off stage in rehearsal. We just never did it. I, I don't know why. And one day there I am with my Julia and we've never kissed before. And I go to kiss her and I just went like this. I went, right? And I backed up and I was like, wow, that was not a good kiss. Uh, what kind of <laughs> kiss is that? This is Romeo. What would a Puerto Rican Romeo do? So I grabbed her, I dipped her, and then I kissed her for about 20, 30 seconds. The conductor's like, ah. <laughs> I stood her up and then I walked away, blacked out. Round of applause. <laughs> yeah, All so. right. Um, just say I go. Okay, I actually had two questions. Um, my first question was, what is your target audience? Like, do you like dancing for children more or do you like dancing for like adult audience? And that goes for like your instructor job as well. Like, do you like teaching kids more or do, does it not matter? That's a great question. Actually, my target audience is whoever wants to learn and whoever wants to watch. Um, for me, it doesn't matter um, what race you are, what age you are, as long as you want to do dance and you want to be in the audience or be on stage with me, I would love to share the passion of dance with you. Um, I have a lot of different ranges of students. For example, I believe my youngest student is 13. And I wanna say my oldest student is probably uh, in their 50s. So my range of students is really, really large. When it comes to the audience member at Congresses or the places that we perform, normally and typically is 18 and over just because it's like nightclub atmosphere. You know, there's no alcohol and stuff like that at some events, but it's normally on the adult side of thing. Now in the competition world, there's actually teenagers and adults. So when I do the competition world events, I actually bring a smaller group of, I'm sorry, a group of a younger age to come compete at these places. And they can be anywhere from six years old all the way up to 17. So the answer is everybody. <laughs> okay, so Moving into the next question that I have, we have covered like one question, you guys. So this is really good because it, that's the point of it to get everybody going and you know, one question can lead to something else. Um, so when, what made you decide, you started with salsa, Jose. Now, when did the bachata come in and how, what made you wanna go into becoming a bachata dancer? Great, absolutely. It's a great question. Um, so salsa was first, but salsa was first. If we go back in time when my dad used to sing salsa, bachata actually came when I was in high school. So bachata was actually the dance that we danced in high school. Like for example, uh, kids today dance, I don't know, hip hop and you know, whatever music they dance today in Puerto Rico, it was reggaeton and bachata. Those were the dances that we danced in high school. So I still remember Omora Flor, Juan Luis Guerra, when it first came out, and I was like, it, it, it was a huge explosion of that in Puerto Rico. Now, the bachata that we danced back then to the bachata that we dance right now, not even close. Back then, it was more like, you know, hands down. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Now it's actually structured dance and turn patterns and stuff like that. 
but back then it was not that. It was completely different. So I danced bachata at an early age, all the way up to maybe like 17 and 18 years old. And then I went through my ballet career. And then when I competed, for example, in the competition world, the only rhythm allowed to compete was salsa. Mm -hmm. Bachata was not there yet. So then when in the competition world, bachata was introduced, then we have an explosion of bachata. Um, when Romeo Santos with Aventura started mixing R&B with bachata, it was an explosion of bachata. So teams started doing, and for example, at the events, one room will be 3,000 people of salsa, and there will be a second room right next to the bathrooms when you can only fit 50 people, and that was the bachata room. It was considered the dark side of the congresses, right? But I've always had a love and passion for bachata because that's what I grew up listening to. Juan Luis Guerra, like all, all day, that's what I grew up listening. So when bachata was introduced to the competition world, then my interest switched from salsa to, to bachata. And then about three years ago, I made the 100% transition to go in my company to go from salsa all the way 100% bachata. So now the salsa that we do, we do a fusion that I call mambo fusion. Mm -hmm. So I dance, um, for example, in Univision, in Sao Gigante. I dance at the Latin bill billboards, almost like a backup dancer, you know, jeans, no shirt, poser, I call it, yeah. And we used to do this like fusion of like salsa and hip hop and posing. So I grab that rhythm with salsa one, two, three and mix it. So I do one, two, three, five, six, seven, but then I do a booty roll and a hair whip at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And um, so now how many, your whole company, can we talk about a little bit about how, give us an idea of like how many people are in your company right now? Absolutely. So my name of the company is called Evolución Latina Dance Company. And here we're based out of Chicago. We about to celebrate two years. Um, we have about 120 members here in Chicago, and we are actually in 14 different cities. I believe we're a little bit over 600 members that we are right now. Um, obviously, through COVID, some of them are closed. Some of them are actually opening right now as we speak. So right now, is extremely busy for us. Um, the way we do it is through video. We do a lot of video recording, a lot of video submission, and we actually open our rehearsals for anybody to see the uh, Zoom and now that we have links. So we have online memberships that open the doors for different people that maybe they didn't have the exposure or they don't have the facility um, to be exposed to this type of training. So, yeah. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Um, Lily, you have another question? Yeah, was there ever a point in your career like something happened and you felt like quitting? Like something like didn't go right and you just felt like stopping and doing something else? Absolutely, when I was a ballet dancer, um, you get hired right after high school. So at 17 years old, you have to have a contract. If you don't have a contract by 17, the chances of you getting a contract, I don't even know, uh, 20%, 10%, something like that. So when I graduated high school at 17, I auditioned for a company, didn't get it. I was like, okay, I'm going to wait a little longer, 18. I auditioned for the company, I didn't get it. Okay, I'm going to wait a little bit longer. At 19, at 19 years old, I had two jobs. I worked at a bagel store from 4 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock in the morning making bagels. Then I would go to ballet from 9 so 3.30, and then I will go wait tables from 4.45 to close. And I did this every day for three years until at age 20, I got my first contract. So that summer of age 20, I said, if I don't get a contract this summer, I have to quit. I have to quit. So what did I do? I actually trained every day outside of all that work for 10 hours and I took five classes a day. I was so tired, but I beat my body and trained. I will be at home. I remember to this day, I had a, a, a tape, duct tape square with an X and a circle. And I will put my foot in relevant and practice balances. And I, I, I didn't even have ballet shoes. I had duct tape with socks because I didn't have money to afford to get ballet shoes until I learned to do pirouettes, double tour, 
And I did all of this in between my bed and the door of my, of my room, right there. That little bit, I had a square and I would do my pirouettes and my double tours right there every time. And I would just do it all the time, all day long. And that's what I did. So I would say the summer of when I was 20, whatever year that was, it was when I reached my point of almost quitting. And I'm glad I didn't because I actually didn't get a contract until after the summer in August. So that I actually was recommended the last class that I ever took. I was like, I'm going to try. And I went and then I got my contract. I got my break. And then two years later, I became a principal dancer. That's really good. Uh, Marlene, go for it. I had a question, like piggybacking on someone else's question. I'm not sure who asked it. They asked about sure. challenges, um, about like being a dancer. And you mentioned that uh, being like a ballet dancer and being Puerto Rican. I wanted you to elaborate a little bit more about why being like Puerto Rican was such a struggle. Was it cultural? Was it just like your environment? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, a couple of things, it was culture, for example, like uh, in, in, in the ballet world, in the company, in the ballet world, uh, back then, not now, now it's completely different and completely open. But back then, I would say there would be one Hispanic in the company and one African-American in the company. And that was it. And everybody knew that. So we used to do research on companies who didn't have a Latino or an African-American or even an Asian in the company. And we used to make a list of companies. Okay, this doesn't have it, this doesn't have it, this doesn't have it. And we used to go and audition for these companies to get that one spot. Uh, my best friend, uh, his name is Jorge Luis Rojas de los Santos. His name is Cookie. Um, and him and I used to go and audition and audition and audition. And he actually got hired by Ohio Ballet, I believe in Akron, the year before I got hired. Yeah, and it was the same thing. So it was a man, he was Dominican and I was Puerto Rican and we would be auditioning together for one spot in the company. So that was a challenge. But today I believe that doesn't exist. Um, one of the great things about the company of uh, Columbus City Ballet in South Carolina, when I got there, I would say he was one of the first ones to open the doors. William Starr, bravo to him, was to open the doors to the African-American community to come into the ballet world. He even did a ballet called uh, Guessing the Art of Jonathan Green, which is about Gullah culture. And Jonathan Green came up and we have Marlena sing on stage live. It was beautiful. I get goosebumps just thinking about it. And then to this day, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even dare to say besides Ailey um, and, and other companies that he's probably one of the top companies in the, in the ballet world that broke that boundary and said, I don't care. Uh, I mean, his principal dancer was uh, Ponika Jones. Ponika, a, a beautiful dancer. I believe right now, Willie Moore Jr. is down there, an amazing dancer. You know, and all these dancers, I believe Tori Cowles, Maurice Johnson is down there. And the, all these dancers that have been there for an extensive amount of time that created a career down there in Columbia City Ballet, William Starr did that. And this is like 2001, 2002. You know, Misty Copeland, for example, came later, way after, right? Does that make sense? So this is way, way before that. So, yeah. Now, so right now, uh, let's ahead. do a time check because I know you have a little bit of time with us, Jose, yes. but if you're okay, we have a couple more questions. Yeah? Sure, go ahead. Okay, so Snow, you're up. Hello. So Hi. you mentioned a lot of differences between um, Latin dancing and ballet, but what are some of like the major similarities between the two styles? Absolutely. Major similarity is choreography. So the same thing is, you take class to learn a rhythm. You rehearse a piece that the teacher changes every week. You wear a costume that never fits. And then you go on stage and perform and you mess up one time and then you feel hard. Nah, right? No, but it's the same, pretty much the same structure is you take a class, you rehearse, you go on stage and you perform and you tour. It is exactly the same way. The difference is, for example, a ballet company has like a home theater. And they always perform in the same theater versus in the Latin world, we don't really have a home theater like that. The studio is our home theater, right? But what we do is that we go outside from our city and we perform at different cities. For example, Rodrigo and Wendy every year go to DCBX in, um, in DC. Then they go to Orlando Congress. Uh, this past weekend, they went to Miami for Bachateando. 
and they always go to these places outside to represent. And you'll hear it all the time. Uh, well, you know, Wendy, from Charlotte, round of applause. Ah! So everybody feels really proud to represent their city at these events outside their city. So I would say those are the differences and similarities is that you get to perform, you get to tour, you get to take class, do a rehearsal, do a piece in stage, you do tech rehearsal the same way. We still call it downstage, upstage, stage right, stage left, house right, house left, yeah. Everything is all the same terms. We have lights. We don't have legs on stage. We actually don't have legs because we have what's called a concert stage, which is an open base stage, yeah? V different than a theater stage that has wings and legs and stuff like that. So that doesn't exist. But some stages now have lights, they have booms, they have across, they have electrics across. So the Congress world has up their game and they actually have a whole production and they're trying to be like, you know, compete with a real theater. And this is all portable because they actually have to build it. Um, one of the instances that we have an event on a cruise ship called ABC and they had a, the only place that the stage fit was on top of the pool. So the middle, the middle beams was underwater and they built a whole stage and a platform for people to dance. I saw the way they built that and it was amazing to watch. I'm talking water and they and back up for air and they put the whole stage and it was amazing. The production crew did a great job. So yeah, I would say it's pretty, pretty similar. Yes. But what about the actual like dancing? Like any similarities between the actual choreography? So the actual choreography, yes. For example, there's promenades, right? There's finger turns and there's whip turns, right? There's Petit Allegro side by side. We don't call it Petit Allegro. We call it shines. Um, we have batmans. We have splits. We have jumps. We do coupagetes all the time. We do shoulder sit. We do press lifts every single time. Every single thing that you can possibly do in ballet in the Latin world, I will actually say we have a freedom to do it different. Because in the ballet world, sometimes it's very structured. Now we can just do a press lift. When the Latin world, we can do a press lift into a bluebird, into a one hand, into down, into a booty roll. You couldn't do that. I mean, I mean, you could do it in Swan Lake, but it'll be a little bit, you know, can you imagine Swan Lake being like, right? Uh, <laughs> it would just be, I mean, you can do it, but uh, you better bore it somehow, right? <laughs> Does that make sense? So I would say when it comes to the structure of dance is very similar. Um, giving you a little bit of history in the Latin dance, how it was born. So back in New York, trained dancers from Broadway used to come into, for example, the nightclubs of New York and perform in their off season. The music that was being played was salsa. Well, trained dancers didn't know what that was. All they know is they see the people social dancing and they go, okay, so they're going forward and back and do a little turn. Well, we can do that. So then they used to do the same thing, a little forward and back and do multiple turns and do finger turns and do whip turns. And it's incredible. And you can see these videos on YouTube. You can Google it. Uh, first Latin dancers ever in New York. And there'll be black and white videos. And you see tornado spins. You see Batman's because they, they were trained dancers from Broadway on their off season getting jobs at these clubs in New York, which was awesome, which shaped what, what dance, what our Latin dance is today. What the frame, we didn't do frame. And in the, in the Latin dance, we do hand to hand. We don't do, this was technique. Our dance is here. You go to any street house in any country that teaches salsa as a little kid and it's here. And you dance just here, just hands. This is a classroom environment thing. Yeah, so that was later on added. So I would say one of the bases of the Latin dance today is actually structured by trained dancers. You should, you should look at those videos, Wendy. You should put them out to them so they can see it and they can see yeah. a full ballerina with the hands and fit and uh -huh. being like, ah, and doing salsa. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's amazing to watch. I rem remember the, there's a gentleman by the name of Tito Orto. He does a salsa history video and he puts those videos up and every time I see them, I get goosebumps. Um, a lot of influence also from tap. I believe the Marlon brothers made a tap dancing routine that was highly influenced, um, that influenced the salsa shines, what it is today, 
the mambo on two with the footwork with the heel toe. So we actually have influences from tap into the mambo world too. Very good. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Calvin, go for it. So one of my questions was uh, any tips for an upcoming male uh, dancer uh, as well as how was it being a male dancer in the ballet world for a little bit? Because I know the sure. ratio is kind of huge. It is. It is kind of huge. Well, back back when I was a, a ballet dancer, it was a little different. I would say there was 50 girls in the company and, or in the school, and there was maybe three guys. That was it. Now it's different. I, last time I went to a ballet school, there was equal male to, to female. So now it's the competition for a male dancer is higher. What I did that somebody recommended to me was, Jose, instead of trying to do what everybody does, why don't you actually just say, what can I do that they can't? And I'm going to maximize what I do. And I was like, hmm, that's a good point. So one of the things that I used to do is I used to lift. I was strong. So I can lift girls. And I realized that they couldn't really lift girls. And I was like, okay. So I would literally go and audition. I used to do this. Booty shorts, no shirt, and just lift girls. <laughs> I swear, just to get attention, to get into summer programs, and it works. I got full scholarship to go into summer programs, and I would just run off stage, do the lift, and run off stage. That's it. My I was like, okay. We're going to have a care. bunch of people auditioning now with, like, yeah. <laughs> lingerie yeah. on. So, yeah. I was like, I don't care. Um, but I would say number two is, as a male dancer, just go through your bases. And for example, if you're a ballet dancer, you need double tour, you need pirouettes, you need second turns, you need a menage of coupe jetes or barrel turns, and you need at least one trick, either soda bath, revelatas, switch leap, 540s, something that you can actually show off and you can just do it. Yeah, that's something that, yeah. And if you're a contemporary dancer, for example, make sure that your flow and your line of movement is not interrupted and make sure that you can interpret music instantly. One of the things that I like to do in my in contemporary class is I like to play random music and I set a piece of movement in choreography and I press play, the dancers don't know what it is and they need to be able to adapt instantly to the count and to the emotion of the music. This develops a different character. And when you're auditioning for a company and they play a specific part of the music, that stands out in a director's eye. So I would say your technique and your character and connection to music to movement. Now, Jose, now for the upcoming Latin dancers, because in like, in from UNCC classes, Rodrigo alone has been teaching for over 13 years. I just got hired for the second uh, semester um, after I graduated from UNCC with a dance degree. And one of the things that we notice is that People come into the class um, expecting for something to be just fun, but then they they get awakened by something deeper than that and they desire to explore more into it. So we have seen people coming out of these classes pursuing you know, a Latin dance uh, career. And one of the right. examples, one of the girls that you know is uh, Ashton Laney. She came from this right. class and now she, She's in Dallas running one of her studios over there with another partner. So she actually came from one of these classes. So what kind of advice will you give for the upcoming Latin dancers? You know, there's so many things that we know we have to do, but what would be one thing that you can just like tell them, start doing this now if, if you know, if you want to pursue, whether it is teaching Latin dance, performing Latin dance or becoming a professional Latin dancer? Absolutely. I would say one other thing is write down all the rhythms of the Latin dance world. So for example, merengue, salsa, salsa on one and two, bachata, cumbia, cha-cha-cha, reggaeton even. We have dance hall now. Um, we, have, we have danza con duro now in Miami. They have a commercial dance. So you want to make a list of all the Latin dances that are available to you on YouTube or online or somehow. And I would say, try to know at least the basic of all the genres of dance and then find out what is your favorite star per rhythm. 
So that way you have a direct idea and a direct vision of how this dance should look like. For example, and I'm one salsa dancer for me is Johnny Vasquez, Fernando Sosa, right? So that's very specific look. And I'm two dancer. I have a bunch of dancers from New York, turn pedalins like Edwin. I love watching all of these people. You know, we have Dominican bachata, tra traditional bachata dancers from Dominican Republic that I watch online. We have Carlos Cinta that does musicality. Then we have the central bachata. So I have a specific artist that I like in all the, in the cumbia dancer, the mixing community. Oh my God, there's a girl named Imalda that dances with her brother. It's like watching liquid water. They're so connected, it's so perfect. And it's improvised. It blows my mind every time I see them dance. You know, and then you have merengueros from New York that fuse merengue, uh, one of the two, Fausto fuses merengue with bachata and acting and, and, and showcase is so exciting, you know? So I would say make a list of all the dances in the land dance, do your research of all the basics of what it is to dance all these rhythms and find out your favorite person doing these rhythms and follow them and study them because this will open your mind up to a different and what and get to know the knowledge and what's out there and what the standard is. Yeah, which is very important. Mm -hmm. so that's what I would say. Very good. All right, Jose, um, I only asked you for 30 minutes and we that's have okay. you here for almost an hour already. So if you're still okay, I we I'm do still have okay. more questions. Okay, yeah? go ahead. Jashea, you're up, go for it. Hi. Um, my, question, my question was, um, is there any other type of dance that you would like to learn or that you are inspired by? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, so I actually have a very extensive, like I even do aerial silk. I do pole dancing, for example. I love heels. I do a lot of any dance that I find that I incorporate. Um, I think one of the dances that I have not dipped into is like Irish dance, you know, with the feet. I haven't dipped into that. I would like to try that one day, see, see how that goes. Um, the Indian dance, anytime I see the Indian dance performers, I don't even know, I don't even know the name of it and I should. Um, there's a big group that travels around the Congresses I forget the gentleman name and he has like 20 girls and he's the only guy and it looks like so much fun. They have these red pants and they have these bells on their hand and they just jamming on stage and it looks like so much fun and so much energy. I would like to dabble in the, into the Indian dance um, world also. Um, the other dance, um, there's a dance um, in ballroom, for example, the bolero of ballroom. Every time I see somebody dance bolero, I'm like, Wow, it's, it's like falling in love. And then tango, uh, Rodrigo and Wendy actually have done a, a couple of performances and of tango and anytime they do it, I literally feel like they're meeting for the first time on stage and falling in love, right? But I've never done any research of, I've never done any research of tango and stuff like that. So I would say those dances are the ones that stand out. Outside of that, there's a Russian dance uh, they do a folk dance with a lot of kicks and a lot of jumps and a lot of spins and tricks. Um, I believe the company's called Moiseev, I believe. Um, they have a, it's all males. And it's, it's amazing these, the things that they do. I would say something like that, too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Awesome. And Anna, you're up. Okay, so did I hear correctly when you said that you performed before on Sábado Gigante and on Univision? Yes, correct. Okay, so for the people who don't know, Sábado Gigante is a show that's been for 50 plus years and it is iconic to the Latino community. Correct. So, and uh, Univision is also a big channel, big in the community as well. Correct. So, in that moment when you were performing there, what thoughts were going through your head? How nervous were you? And the last question is, did you meet Don Francisco? Oh, right. So uh, his name is Mario and people don't know that. But yes, I did meet Don Francisco. He's actually really nice. He is really, really funny, but he's also really serious about his work. The first time I was in Saudiante, I believe I went there as a competitor. I did the competition 
I don't know the name, Baila con Rimo. It was some sort of competition and stuff like that. And that opened the doors for me to go into Sao Gigante. Um, then I was working directly with a producer named Paula at the time. And I became almost like a talent search agent. So anytime I would go to congresses from the Latin world and I would see somebody, but like, wow, I think they'll be great for Sao Gigante. And I made a list of email of dancers. And I used to send links in YouTube to Paula. And a lot of these dancers, next thing you know, they're on the show. And I, I did this, I want to say, for roughly six years, six, seven years. So I was there in almost at the end of the per, of the of the of Sao Gigante. I believe Sao Gigante right now does not run anymore. I think he has another show now. Um, my sister was also a competitor. I competed there with multiple, multiple people from the Latin world. I met uh, Carlos and Arlette. They were dancers in, uh, from New York that created this company called Sapphire. I actually met him at the program before there was Sapphire, which was an uh, interesting story and very really close to my heart. Um, so yeah, I used, I opened the doors of Sao Gigante for a lot of performers in the Latin world that were available to me and they were able to do the same thing and go, some of them won the car, some of them came home with $2,000, $5,000. Others actually got a contracted from there to go back to do a show called Mira Quien Baila. Yeah. So by a producer named, I believe it's Poti is his name. I believe, I'm not sure if he's a producer anymore or not, but that's who it was at the time. And Mira Quien Baila is still there. Um, a lot of people from Philadelphia um, that went down. I believe a guy named uh, Raul was in Mira Quien Baila. He's in LA now teaching a millennium and has his own career at the commercial world that opened up from this specific opportunity, you know? So, um, so Sao Gigante for me was a huge tool and whatever Latin dancer around me was, I will always open the door and help them and open the avenue for them. Cause you never know what happens out of that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's beautiful how you open so many doors for other people with the opportunity that you had. Oh, thank you, thank you, yeah. But in Sao Gigante, I was nervous the first time because um, it's a live recording. I've done other commercials, I've done other TV shows, I even been interviewing the news, the news is live too, but sometimes it's pre-recorded. Well, there's something about dancing live, like what if I trip and fall, right? What if the music stops, right? And like, it's, it's, it's so, it was nervous. There's actually a video of me, I'm playing in Sao Gigante. I'm not sure if Wendy can find it. I think I even ripped my clothes off at one point and shook my chest and that's how I made it to, and that's how I made it to round two, yeah? yeah. I don't know, half naked, on huh? TV. Uh, you gotta use your, you gotta use your tools, yeah? <laughs> Big dip. Well, Jose, it's been an honor to have you in this class, in my class as a guest. Um, I want to thank you for your time and for everything Absolutely. that you've done for the, for the dance community. Your, your uh, presence in the dance community can change um, with the relationships that you create and the, all the doors that you can open for other people. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, for sharing your story with us. Um, if we have more time, I swear we will keep going and keep picking your brain. Yes. So but, no. Please, please, please thank you guys for participating and thank you, Jose, for, for sharing your time with us. I, I, I want to show you something real quick. Rodrigo and Wendy are so close to me that I even have a couple of their shirts for the logos. And I wear them all the time. This is probably one of my favorite shirts, yeah? Um, this is an event that we did, the I Love Bachata event that was amazing. I had such a great time. And I believe... I believe in Rodrigo and Wendy so much and you know, support them in everything that they do. They're great instructors, great artists, and very nice for you guys. Round of applause for doing this for you and Wendy. I think it's amazing that you guys are opening the door for the trained dancers to come into the Latin community because that's one of the things that is so important to me is to let people know that the Latin world is a career. Mm -hmm. You can make a living. This is actually something that is a nine to five job. It just so happens to be 6 p.m. till 2 a.m. job. And you happen to travel every weekend. A doctor travels, well, a dancer travels too. Yeah? Right. And right. In, in the Latin world, we've gone as far as Broadway. There's a production on Broadway right now. And there's a lot of salsa dancers that one day was just like you. 
sitting down, listening to somebody talk, and they went to take an audition. And next thing you know, now they're touring on Broadway. I believe it's called On Your Feet. Yeah. On Your Feet, yeah. When we yeah. went to see it, it was so happy to see some of our friends out there. Absolutely. Yeah, it's amazing to see. How um, I believe some of them been in movies, a movie called The Shine. Yeah. A lot of people just like you, next thing you know, they're in a movie. Like, what? This doesn't make any sense. So <laughs> the Latin world and the Latin community had exploded and it, it has opened doors and avenues for dancers, you know. Um, another thing for trained dancers, when you're a trained dancer in the ballet world, for example, there are certain rules. Let's just say color of your skin, let's say weight, let's say body shape. There's a lot of different rules. There's something beautiful about the Latin world that I want to say is those rules do not exist. Mm -hmm. As long as you have a heart and you give it your 100% on stage, the audience will respect you and they will clap for you and you will always have a job and a position in the Latin world. That's how beautiful this world is because there is no judgment when it comes to that. There is all kinds of shapes and colors and sizes. There's even people that teach in the Latin world from a wheelchair. There's people that are blind. There's people that can't hear and they teach and they have a career in the Latin world. It doesn't matter what your background is. If you're passionate and you train in your art form, you will always have a job in the Latin world, yes? Yeah. So I just wanted to say thank you so much, you guys, for your time. Thank you, Jose. Thank you so much. All right, you guys, we have just a couple more minutes. We're going to let Jose log off and we'll finish our class with some more details about the upcoming assignments, okay? Thank you. Thank you so much, Jose. Thank you. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, ciao. Bye.